how's it going? Welcome to episode number 26, Da Chu, of Someone Who Isn't Me. Um, my guest on Swim is Randy Bly. Um, most of you are going to know him as the frontman and singer of Lamb of God, but he's also, among other things, a New York Times bestselling author for his book, Dark Days. He's a, a radio presenter, an excellent and accomplished photographer, and an all-round good man. Um, so we met up when the band was over here and they were about to play Wembley Arena because they were direct support to Slayer on their last ever London headline show. We hung out for a little bit and over the course of the chat we discussed some pretty heavy stuff to do with you know, the nature of being in the public eye and the current state of things in the world, his love of photography and how he ended up singing for Bad Brains at a couple of shows as well. Um, he's super smart, he's a really funny guy, and one that's definitely navigating life on several planes at once, if you know what I mean, as is often the case with any artist, to be fair, but um, he's faced a bunch of really crushing adversity, and he's not only dealt with it honestly, but he's come out the other side of each event with, with a lot of dignity, and I, I think a newfound perspective on things, um, and that's kind of coloured like a spiritual component to his life, I think, which often gets overlooked. And he's a hippie punk, surf rap, essentially, all-round good dude. The way that this conversation started, um, it made me laugh at the time, and, and I'm into it, it's wicked. But as I was going back through listening to it and checking the audio levels whilst I was making the painting, which is the portrait of Randy that I've painted for the cover of this episode, and I listened back to it whilst I was doing that, the talk took on a, a much greater poignancy because... 12 days after we recorded this episode, my mum passed away from cancer. Now, I think it's fairly clear if you're a regular listener to Swim, you, you probably have a decent idea on what my views are on things of a spiritual and mystical nature, I guess. Um, yeah, they're there for everyone to hear. So the actual event of my mum passing for me has been... Um, it was it was more about the acceptance of like a of a transition, I guess, and, and I was prepared for it. Uh, it wasn't a surprise. I knew like m my whole family knew that she was sick. Um, she'd been ill before and then had treatment, and we thought that that she was in the clear. But then um, it came back, but. I think she kind of kept it from everyone for for a little while. Um, so I think she was probably more aware of it than she let on. And she was interesting as well. Like I remember a few weeks before um, she passed away, she'd already planned her funeral. She'd called me and my brothers and asked us to be coffin bearers. Um, so she'd uh, had a pretty decent handle on it anyway. Um, I'd also say that on the long drive down to get to my parents in Somerset, whilst I was driving down there, I, I, I basically was told, you know, you, you, you've got to come down mums really in not a good way. And I listened back to the episode of the podcast that I did with Dan from Architects, where we talked about the passing of his brother Tom from cancer. And listening back to that actually helped kind of reaffirm a lot of my thoughts it clarified how I felt about things um, so I'm really grateful for that it's funny how things sort of um, make more sense after the fact yeah anyway so with all that in mind let's press on this is Randy Bly from Lamb of God and we're off is that going good how long have you got what how long have you got how long have I got yeah I don't know, man. Everybody's uh, lifespan is undetermined. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, man. I mean, I hope forever. I decided one time I was never going to die. Well, I was referring to like this afternoon, but that, I mean, we could jump straight in Let's, on that if you want to. Go straight <laughs> to the, into the broader question. How long have we got? How long have we got? Well, I mean, it depends on what you <laughs> believe about time itself. Which is a construct. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a... The, the way people understand time... Like, it's six o'clock. 
you know, yeah. and everything's there are these arbitrary divisions of individual moments that really have no meaning whatsoever. No. Right. Six o'clock. What does six o'clock mean? It means nothing. It's our attempt to measure <sighs> and, and quantify, and quantify reality. the unknowable. Yeah. And the only thing that truly exists, of course, is this very moment. Yes. You know, it is this moment right now, Mr. Dan Carter, you and I here in the basement of Wembley. This is the only thing. Oops, it's gone. And now we're on to the next one. Yeah. Which looked much like the one before. But is the previous moment gone? We don't know. Existence is one long stream of this very moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing that evolves is, is right now. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. I think... The living in the moment is um, is something that you you slowly actually discover and come to terms with as you get a little older. Yeah, you find. Yeah, of course. I mean, think about someone who's laying on their deathbed. Hmm. You know, uh, all they have is one moment left. You know, the, and 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 they don't know when that moment's going to end. Hmm. You know, they have to be in. I think I think that's when everything becomes sort of concrete to people probably yeah you know like how are you going to spend this moment because you may or may not have any more it's an interesting one man i found that as i've got older that i i I want to value my time more yeah and yet i still find that i'm living it as if i'm still 18 years old and i have all the time in the world uh yeah definitely um feel well, we're, we're, how old are you? 40, f- nearly 46. Yeah, I'm, I'm 47. I'll be 48 in February. Yeah. I, I think I'm having like, kind of like a reverse midlife crisis. <laughs> like I'm wanting to become more responsible and stuff. <laughs> you know, most did, people. Did, did you have a midlife crisis to then have like this rebound from though, do you think? I mean, well, I mean, I don't know. My whole life has been a crisis. There's, you know, yeah. like, so I, I just think mentally and emotionally, whereas most people my age uh, go out and, and start fucking their secretary and get a sports car or, you know, join a fight club or whatever it is that middle-aged dudes yeah. do um, in order to sort of feel alive feel alive or whatever i'm like whoa i gotta i need to slow down a little bit more and 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 use my time wisely yeah because it despite the nature of time being an illusion it is at the same time finite our time on the earth so you know i want to use my time wisely i i think about you know what do I want to to leave as I hate to use the word legacy, but w- what will people remember me yeah for you know well yeah I mean you've got a pretty impressive resume, man right though the last thing I want to be remembered for is, is as the singer of Lamb of God, yeah, yeah, I don't give dude who cares yeah but yeah, but that's the thing, isn't it? I think a lot of people, a lot of artists use use that as their means of immortality to a certain degree, do you think? Sure, sure. In music, you know, if you think about, you know, music itself, it, it being sound waves, you know, um, like a, you hit a note on a guitar, it emanates this sound wave, and that wave travels out and, uh, and reaches the audience and keeps on going. It's a form of energy, and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Yeah. So, in a sense, music just goes forever and ever and ever. So, the music that you make is, in fact, immortal. But, so is a fart. (laughs) That (laughs) makes noise, too. So... I, yeah. I guess I guess it's and I don't know if smells last for you know if that's a, an energy, but um, I think I don't know. It's it's trying to figure out like what to do with the time that you have on Earth and what you can do constructive. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? It's putting yeah. good things out into the into the universe. Yeah, that's all we can hope to do. Yeah. 
But yeah. like, I, I don't want to be remembered as a heavy metal singer. Why? Uh, because it's like the probably one of the, the least important parts of my life. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's other people's perceptions, though, yeah, isn't it? Other people's a, perceptions are always going to be, most times people meet you, it will be, you're Randy from Lamb of God. Yeah, and that's a cartoon character. Yeah. You know, I don't run around screaming and hollering and headbanging, you know, like I do on stage in my, in my everyday life. Yeah. Why in the fuck would I do that? You yeah, know? but those things are always going to define us, aren't they? The things that we're most known for. Well, they're, they're, um, they're going to define us to other people. Yeah, exactly. But, but to me, uh, it does not define me at all. But do you find that the imposition of other people's opinion is still going to go somewhere in defining you as, as you are, as yourself, as you react to people? Mm. Well... <laughs> I th- yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, the imposition of other people's perception may force you to, I don't know, act in a certain way. Like, for instance, like when I wake up, as I did this morning, and I was late because I'm jet lagged because we haven't had any fucking sleep, hmm. and I miss the shuttle over here. I walked from the hotel, and I'm I just woke up. You know, I had no coffee, brush my teeth, I grab my suitcase, I walk out. I'm like, where in the fuck am I? There's a ton of people out front, and they're like, oh my god, <laughs> and like. They start running over. Uh, I'm just like, I just woke up. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, come on. And this dude's like, take a fucking picture. I'm like, I got to get downstairs because I didn't even know what time our interview was. Like, I thought, for all I knew, I was late for the press. No, it was me that was late. Yeah, I know. And it's like, I can't be like, I, for an instance, I have to... Like, even though I've just woke up, I have to smile and say, hello, everyone, because yeah. I know that you're looking at me. And, and then this dude runs up with the camera and he's like shoving it in my face. And I'm just like, fuck off. <laughs> yeah. I just woke up. Yeah. You know, but I was pretty mild about it. So like. That's a tough one. Though, like right? like I, when when a normal person, if he were walking down the street and he just woke up and, and you weren't in this you weren't a public person. If someone ran up to them and tried to put their arm around them and shove a camera in their face, yeah. how, how would a normal person react? You know? So in that sense, it can make you, it can make you behave a certain way because you're used to it. You know, like it's kind of like, okay, I get it. You guys are excited to see me. Uh, you can't it, like a, a normal person, like would just be like, what the fuck? Yeah. And maybe take a swing on a person who's trying to, like, run at them or whatever. I'm not going to do that, probably. Because yeah. I know these people don't mean any harm. And they're happy to see me and all that shit. But at the same time, it's like, whoa, I just woke up. I'm a normal human being. Give me mm. a second. You were know? you that kid, though, when you were growing Fuck up? Fuck no. No, because, I mean, no. it's funny, isn't it? Because, because I went to the punk rock shows exactly. where, there, where there is a guy... I never fucking sat around and, and like was like, I'm going to wait for an autograph, blah, 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 you know? I waited for an autograph one time, and it was just to get an autograph from my wife because I thought it would be cool. As soon as I got off a tour with one of my other bands, I heard that HR from Bad Brains was going to be signing records at our local record store, which is near my house. And I was like, oh, cool, I'll go see him. And I just started dating the woman who is now my wife. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to go get something signed for her. Not for me. Signed for her. And I'm going to go see HR because who knows with him, you yeah. know, who knew at that time. And so I, I bought a copy of the Quickness album because I didn't have anything for him to sign. Mm-hmm. And I got him to sign it to my wife or my girlfriend at the time, you know. Sealed the deal. Yeah. And it was just, <laughs> it was just funny, you know, to me. Yeah. But it wasn't like I'm going to wait outside the venue. I'm going to wait outside someone's hotel. I'm, I, I, don't, I never did that stuff. But it's different, isn't it? Like, I think that that thing now is anyone that's in the public eye um, within music, especially, like, that seems so much more prevalent now just because of how 
celebrity in in quotes is is viewed it's ludicrous yeah it's like this uh celebrity is it's just it's it's like this illusion man especially with social media and all that shit like it's it's this fleeting grasp and i think it's led to a lot of like bad stuff yeah. People doing a lot of bad shit in order to, to gain attention on fucking Facebook or whatever. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and the police love social media. <laughs> they love social media because people do stupid things and post it, you know? Something I found interesting now is when you apply for an ESTA to go over to the States, they ask you as an optional extra if you want to if what social media you use and do you want to put your what your social media when you apply is. for a what an esther like a, oh, visa, a visa yeah for a visa holy shit which What's i find social media yeah it's kind of sinister yeah that's fucking wacky i didn't know that yeah yeah but the cops love social media yeah of course you know yeah. um and the whole thing is is like gaining some sort of recognition for for doing nothing, something transitory that leaves no permanent positive mark on the world. What's the point of it? You know, it's just like constant sort of a, a desperate narcissism, I suppose, you know, uh, which has led to a lot of bad shit, I think. Yeah. You know, but good comes from it, too. Yeah, there's a lot of good... You can do a lot of good with social media. You know, the you Arab can. Spring, for example. Yeah. That, was, that was all through Facebook yeah. and social media. I've used social media to raise money for charitable causes as well. Yeah, there you go. I saw that recently with the Grammy medal again. Yeah, yeah which again. Which is amazing. Yeah, and my buddy and I, who uh, I originally auctioned the Grammy medal for, he and I are going to figure out something to, to auction it off for again. Because two people, both named Dan, by the way, who bought the thing have both said y'all keep it i just want to yeah to raise money so that's positive and know? it's a thing now too yeah like that's the thing yeah it's it's got it's like become like a totem yeah it's got it's got good energy to it for yeah. sure yeah man yeah it is funny i was thinking about about this like when i was a kid as well i was never that I was never that guy to there was a couple of times where I'd go and hang out. There, were, there was like a record store in London. And they would have sign-ins by bands. Yeah. But I think that's a thing that, that you do when you're a kid to a certain degree anyway. Like I look, I look at things now and, and I still have moments where I'm like, I want to pinch myself and wish I could tell younger me. Yeah. That this is how things will pan out. But yeah. Dude. I bet. Well, I mean, look at you. You're bat singing for Bad Brains. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, all the bands that I listened to when I was a kid, like, I'm friends with them now. Yeah. You know? It's wild, isn't it? Yeah. And, and on the metal side of things, it's like I, I'm friends with Slayer and Metallica, you know? Mm. And those were really the two bands I listened to, the only two real aggressive metal bands as I, I listened to when I was in high school, you know? I didn't listen to much metal, but... All the other fucking bands, you know, I know guys in Black Flag, Misfits, Descendants, hmm. COC, Bad Brains, I fucking sing for them sometimes. It's, it's crazy, you know? But all of that sort of makes sense to me in a way because of the nature of that scene. It's not yeah. about being famous. No, I get that. But that doesn't mean to say that just because you grew up as a kid and you're obsessed with... Eye against eye, that you're going to end up singing for bad boys. Yeah, that's you know what true. I mean? That's true. I mean, I never would have saw that coming for yeah. sure. You know. How did that come about then? Uh, I met Daryl through John Joseph from the Cro Mags. Yeah. And I met John Joseph through Jamie Josta, and I interviewed Daryl for a radio show I had on Sirius XM that Jose gave me. You know, Jose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gave me a show while I was awaiting trial uh, in order, after I got out on bail and I was waiting to go back on trial, he's like, you need to do something to keep your mind off things and, and yeah. 
do good stuff. So do you want a radio show? And I always love Jose for that. You know? Yeah. He's a great fucking guy. And so I was like, yeah, um, but I don't want to interview metal dudes because like, that's not what I really listened to, hmm. you know, growing yeah. up. So basically it was like, I just started picking these punk rock bands that I listened to in high school and started interviewing them. It, it was like a punk rock kid's dream. Yeah. You know, or if, you know, any music fan, whatever you're into, it's like, I love this. So I'm going to go talk to the, my favorite bands about this. And yeah. I'd already met some of the people. So like, you know, I'm a huge cro fan. I'm a huge COC fan. I'm a huge Sam Hain fan. And I already knew guys in those bands one way or the other. So I was like, do you want to do my radio show? And I was doing this show with John Joseph. And I was like, I want to interview someone from the Bad Brains. He's like, I'll call Daryl. And then I interviewed Daryl and we just got along really well and exchanged numbers. And then they had this secret show that came up, which was Daryl's art opening. You know, it was in a gallery in Brooklyn that Questlove runs from The Roots. And it was unannounced that the band was going to be playing. And he was like, we want to do some of the fast stuff. Uh, but HR is not really doing that anymore, the super fast stuff. So Why is that? Is that, is that uh, as a physicality or is it just because he doesn't want to do it? Does he, mm, um, I don't think, you know... HR had a brain operation. Yeah. Well, have you seen the documentary about him? No, you not yet. You need to watch it, Finding yeah. HR, or, or Finding Joseph I. Yeah. Uh, it's awesome. He, HR is in a, a much better place than he's been in years. You know, hmm. He had some issues that he finally accepted help for You know, that had been going on for years. Uh, his wife got him some, some help, and then he started getting these really intense headaches like blindingly painful headaches um, to the point, I think they call them cluster headaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. suicide syndrome, because it makes some people, and I had a buddy who used to get them as well. Yeah. But he had actually had a brain operation to try and fix that. They cut his fucking head open. So that improved some of the, some of the symptoms to the point where he could perform, but it's like, I, I was never like, I don't think it's not that he didn't want to do it or he, uh, he was against it. I don't know. <laughs> like, it, it's just kind of like, they were like, do you want to do some of the fast stuff? HR isn't going to do that. Mm. And I'm like, yeah. And I thought maybe it might be a physical thing, you know, to a degree. But he sang like reignition and stuff, like the mid-tempo yeah, yeah. stuff. And sounded better than he had in years. So I wound awesome. up doing stuff off the first record. And then wound up doing two more shows with him. How did that feel? Because I remember when I saw that you were doing it, I texted you and I was just like, oh, holy shit. Yes. Uh, it was super intense. Because hmm. that band means so much to me. Um, not just as a fan of their music, but in their message. Hmm. You know, everybody, PMA is kind of a catchphrase now, you know. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people know where that came from, how it got popularized. You know, they, of course, took it from Napoleon Hill's books. Yeah. Um, and, but the Bad Brains were the one that brought it into the underground. And that really is something that has stuck with me. It's wild when you think about how that's come about as well. Like yeah. a, like a, self-help book brought into a world that's just super nihilistic but they're like this weird outpost of spirituality yeah amongst it all yeah it's it's pretty wild yeah and you know i still talk to daryl a lot and i talk to all those guys i've gotten to know all of them you know and mm. they're such good dudes um but daryl is he's so chill and I, I was having some difficulties a while back, and I called him. He's like, dude, you just need to sit back and not get caught in, in your head. Mm. You know, don't let the system destroy your head. <laughs> and it's true, you know. The world is fucking crazy, though, man, you know. Yeah, the it world always is. has been, but I think 
I think you focus on things so much, especially now you look at things that are going on around the world, especially where you live. Yeah. And, and you just think, this is so absurd. Yeah. But it's, it's always been that way. It's just that it has. Like, you can look back through history and look at other moments where it's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You know? even, even in recent history, you know? It wasn't yeah. that long ago that a president was shot. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think, you know, I think that's something, though, to pay attention to. Yeah. You know, is that it wasn't that long ago that, you know, someone crazy, like, <laughs> killed the president, you know, or I don't know if he was crazy. You know, who knows? I went to the grassy knoll. You would have loved that place. Have you been? Yeah, yeah, I've been. Dude, what do you think? Well, I found it interesting that they don't let you into the room in the book depository where they was allegedly camped. Right. But if you look, I mean, dude, I, I mean, I grew up. Let's not, this, is, this is a wormhole that we could go down, but let's I grew just up try to country, avoid it. Right? And I'm not a marksman. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a sharpshooter, but I've shot guns. Yeah, me too. Know? And looking at the angles and looking at everything, there's no fucking way. No. That, that, I mean, he probably shot Kennedy from up there, but there's no fucking way that it went down like that. And I went to the spot where the Zapruder film was, was filmed, which was really the first video citizen journalism. Yeah. You know, from whence all of everything we have now you know, um, and I looked at, and I look at the film, and I look at the spot, and I look at the places on the road, mm. and it's just like, there's no fucking way. No. It's just common sense. Why and is it, the guy with the umbrella doing this? Yeah. It, it's like, first couple of shots ring out, and you see some guy open up an umbrella on a, on a blisteringly hot day. Yeah, it's nuts, dude. Yeah. There's, it makes no sense. Well, it kind of does, I guess, if you look into it, but yeah. Yeah. But learning from the past, man. Yeah, learning but from the. Uh, do you think we? Do you think people do, on mass? It doesn't seem that way. The way things are getting stirred up right now, it just doesn't seem. Things that way. are getting stirred up. That's a great way of of looking at it. Mm. You know, internationally, things yeah. are getting stirred up. You know, um, I think there's a lot of uh, fear mongering. Yeah. Of course. You know. Yeah, what's it this month? What is it next month? You know? Yeah. You look back on things like two years ago, you know, we're all going to be wiped out by a pandemic that's starting in one part of Africa. And oh, dude. dude. And people are, people are dying, and this is the start of the plague that's going to be like if you, the Black Death and if, rage across the planet. And then it's like, yeah, next thing in if the news. You, if, the last Slam of God record, there's a song, Engage the Fear Machine. Yeah. That is specifically about that. Yeah. <clears throat> I wrote that right around the time of the Ebola outbreak. Yeah. You know, and there's no doubt about it that Ebola is a fucked up disease, and it, you know, sure. it's, it's horrific. But I was traveling through a lot of airports at that time. And there were, I remember there being television screens everywhere. Uh, and as there are in airports. And every single one of them was talking about Ebola. Yeah. To the point where people were walking through and... And if someone coughed, I noticed people looking at yeah, it. Like and I'm like, the jump, like, geez, swear up and like stuff. what yeah. the fuck, man? Hmm. You know, and I talked to my brother-in-law, who's a um, molecular biologist. And <laughs> he, uh, uh, yeah, he really is. He plays with, like, the AIDS virus and the hantavirus and all wow. that stuff. That's his thing, is playing with things that can kill you in a laboratory. So he's a, he's a fucking scientist, a college professor, right? So yeah. I'm talking to him, I'm like, what do you think about all this Ebola shit? And he goes, well, you know, as far as horrific diseases go, Ebola is a pretty good one because it burns itself out pretty quickly, you know. And I can't remember exactly how he explained it to me, but it, it's like to, to look at the news then through all that, you would have thought it was going to be Night of the Living Dead soon. Yeah. Like it was crazy. Yeah, and before that it was swine flu. Before swine flu, that, it was mad cow flu. disease. Yeah. 
fucking, you know, and that's what that song is about. Mm. It's fear. And for the, the networks that do that stuff, nothing's going to keep you glued to their channel like something that you're scared shitless of, you know? Yeah. The thing with that, though, is if you look, into, look at it that way, which I think is exactly what it is, it, it wasn't divisive the way things are now. Right. Right? Yeah. Now it's like, it's these people. These are the people that we've got to watch out for. Next week, it'll be those people. They're the people you've got to watch out for. And then you look back at history and you go, hang on a minute, only like in the, in the middle of Europe, I don't know, 70 years ago, this seems to be the same situation we were in then, only it was those people yeah. that were the problem. Yeah. I just, you kind of just re have to re resolve yourself to it and it'll be almost like zen-like in the sense that let it just wash over you and not, and not let that fear stiffen you up so you break. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Be like water. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce Lee. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's true. Jesus. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's a crazy time to live in, though, man. What it, a trip. It's crazy. It's a good time for, to be an artist, though. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, to either, A, document those things and draw, draw attention to them, which is, like, as you're saying, as you're doing in the band. Yeah, like, with the band, yeah, it's like the, the, the current climate, of course, if and when Lamb of God ever does a new record, hmm. it will be informed by that. Of course, you, you because... Know, you it, can't, can't help but do it, you yeah. know? Um, but that's what art is. Art should be... It's the product of the artist making it, and that, and that should be informed by their environment, by what's happening in their life, by everything they're absorbing and, and reacting to, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's the best way of trying to keep sane amongst it all. Right. I'm just wondering if there's a way to level the, lower the level of toxicity. I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting, though, because I think, I think there will be a ton of... Well, there's already a ton of bands writing about it, and, and there's a lot of music coming out, especially within punk and hardcore, obviously, because that's been the staple. That's how... Look at the Reagan era. We had so many great bands exactly. come out during that era. Exactly. That, I mean, that was what drew me into this whole nonsense yeah and over here with with like thatcherism and you had all those bands reacting against it yeah and 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 great stuff was was made out of that yeah. but but it just feels like now there's as we go back to social media like now there's a platform for everybody to start picking things apart and shouting and it just seems like i don't know man it's a weird time it's a weird time. I don't want it to turn into old guy chat. Do you know what I mean? But, yeah. But well, there seems to be... It's hard to find an objective sort of viewpoint right now, I think. You know? Like, this is the reality of this situation. Uh, everything is colored by an agenda. At least in America, to my view. You know? I think everywhere, to be fair. Yeah. It, it's... I, I can't really speak on what's happening in, in Europe or, you know, Brazil or, or whatever, yeah. you know, um, because I don't live here. And I think to understand the place, you have to be in it, Yeah. you know, so it's not my, my place to really comment that much on, on stuff elsewhere. But every you, you're in a better position than a lot of people, for, I think, because of the nature of what you do. Yeah, because I can travel. Yeah, you travel, you, know. you see the world from a certain perspective. Yeah, I think that that is, I think maybe that's what is going to give, that maybe gives people like me who travel a better chance of looking beyond all the divisiveness because no matter where I've gone, I've discovered that one undeniable truth is is that people are people mm. people are people everywhere and everybody at the base want the same thing yeah. you know what their idea of the proper way to achieve that same thing which is you know everybody wants security they want friendships love family happiness you know yeah now 
how you achieve that is a much differing matter of opinion. For some people, it's like, we all need to come together and unify and realize that there's no difference. And then on the other hand, you have people who are like, oh, we can't be secure and happy and have our way of life if these people are here. Yeah. You know? So there's... The political situation in America is like so fucked up. It's hard to to put your finger on it. You know. Yeah. It's like it's hard to make any sort of topical commentary on what's going on in America because it changes so rapidly. Everything is so fucking crazy. Yeah. You know. Like yeah, it's like a fast running river of turds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I think on you, the on on a sort of grassroots level, when you talk to people individually about basic human things, everyone is still the same. It's yeah. just a matter of people realizing that. I think. Yeah, I agree. Are you? Would you say you're quite a spiritual person? I try to be. Yeah. Yeah, man. I yeah, try, I, think... I, I try to be, man, because I, I don't... I don't think that, you know, we came from nothing and we'll disappear into nothing. Yeah, I agree. You know, I just don't. That's not what's in my heart. Yeah, it's not wishful thinking on my part. I just feel like... Yeah, I feel there's way more beyond things. Yes. And I mean, I think doing things creatively is is a window into that to a certain degree. And I think it makes that, it clarifies those feelings. For me, it does anyway. Yeah. You agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the way I look at art. It's a way in all of my artistic endeavors, where it be music, photography, or writing, it helps me understand myself in the moment of creation. Hmm. You know, when I look at photographs that I shoot, I'm instinctively drawn to photograph something, right? Yeah. Like it's instinct for me. I'm like, that looks cool. And I take the photo <sighs> and sometimes only later when I look at it, will I understand, I'm like, why was this attractive to me? Yeah. Oh, there was this element, this element, this element, this element. And all of those elements are being processed by my brain, mm -hmm. you know. But too fast for me to dissect in the moment of creation. Yeah. You know, it's like that looks cool because I, I see it and then I'll look at the picture and look at all the different elements and I'll be like, oh, that's why that looks cool to me. Mm. You know, and I, it helps me, you know, at times understand my emotional state in that moment. Yeah. I think photography is, is probably the, the, the best example of that over painting because unless you're working in a super expressive, loose manner with painting, you know, it, it takes, it, it, it can take a long time. Whereas photography is perfecting an art and having an eye and finding it and finding the best way to capture a moment and framing things. Like it's, it's like it is taking a, a a little slice of time right right but and but having it from from a certain perspective because this is the thing like everybody has great cameras yeah everyone has a great camera in their pocket now yeah but they use them for fucking shit most of the time yeah exactly not everyone is going to be and be able another to... example of the narcissism yeah because they insert themselves look here's me here look here's me yeah. here and it used to be you know on the the sort of fabled family vacation okay everybody we'll get someone to stand in front of big ben or whatever and we'll take a picture there. we're having a good time right <laughs> right but like now it's all like i'm here look at me look at me look yeah. at me look at me yeah i'm not interested in my face being superimposed in front of the house of parliament yeah. you know that doesn't do it for me i'm interested in looking at the situation as it is 
because mm. when I insert myself into that situation, I change it. Yeah. You know? But then even capturing a, a, a photograph that you're, do, you're still doing that because you could, you could stand in a spot in wherever, in the most incredible, mind-blowing landscape, right? Say you're at the edge of the Grand Canyon, yeah. right? There's you, there's four other photographers. All, all of you have your own specific way of shooting. Everybody mm -hmm. is a great photographer. And you're going to get different pictures. Four different pictures because yeah. we view it a different way. Yeah. So you are imposing You're your, imposing your, decisions. your sort of viewpoint. There's no such thing as 100% objective photography. Yeah. I you're, like you're not inserting yourself physically within the frame. No. But your aesthetic yeah you know and that's what i'm saying it's like like when i look at photographs later i i understand more about myself yeah you know if i analyze them because i frame things i don't think a lot when i shoot hmm. while i'm shooting yeah because it's an instinctive thing that's it's what art should be yeah poof you know that's why i'm talking about those creative moments are, are, are almost um without getting you could say um connections to higher things yeah 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 <laughs> i don't want to yeah. go too far into it because that sometimes people would just be like what are you talking about oh, who cares go yeah. there yeah, i was reading a book recently that i thought was interesting speaking of painting and of course sculpting um you're familiar with giacometti yeah yeah there's a book called a giacometti portrait yeah by uh, an american journalist who's actually uh, a gay dude um, in the 50s. He was, I think he was in services for a while. You know, of course he was closeted then. But he was friends with Giacometti. And he sat for a portrait of Giacometti in Paris. And Sculptural or drawing? A, a painting. Okay, painting. And the guy's name is James Lord, I believe. Okay. And he sat there and it was Giacometti told him, we'll do this in four or five hours. And it wound up being like 23 days. <laughs> he kept on because Giacometti, who was already an acclaimed painter and sculptor, yeah. you know, world famous, uh, was like just torn by uh, self-doubt. And yeah. he would start painting this guy. And then at the end of the day, this is horrible. And then paint over what he had done. And he'd do this again and again and again and again and again. Yeah. And... Until finally, James Lord was, he was supposed to go back to America. He's like, look, I got to go. And Giacometti's like, this will never be done, you know? And he finally, he tricked him one day because he, he knew by which paintbrushes Giacometti was going to pick up from observing him for this long when he was just going to start wiping out everything he had done. Yeah. And he waited and on the final day until he had finished up with some really fine tip paint brushes, you know, adding little details. And then Giacometti went to pick up the big brush and he's like, oh, it's horrible. And he stood up. He's like, nope, we're done. <laughs> and so that paint, that painting, uh, it's a portrait of James Lord sold a couple of years ago for millions of dollars. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's a great painting, but it, it's a, it's a very interesting book about the, the artistic process. Yeah. yeah. I mean, his is so tortured. You only need to look at his sculptures to see that. Oh, God, yeah. Just whittling away, whittling away, whittling away until, yeah. until they would just snap Yeah, and wouldn't stand. And there was actually a movie made about it called The Final Portrait, I think. Okay. You should check it out. Yeah, I'll check it out. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Who, who are some of your favorite photographers? Because I, I like stuff like for me because I'm not a photographer right I can appreciate the greats right but for me the ones that really move me are the ones that look like paintings right <laughs> in okay. the sense so like I love Whitkin I love Roger Barlin and right. people like that you know I, I'm much more a I'm a like a guy yeah so automatically I am attracted to Henri Cartier-Bresson yeah you know who like, that's the reason why I shoot like it. Because I looked at his pictures when I first started getting into photography. I was looking, I was like, I should look at the history of photography. And his name kept on coming up. And I looked at this book of stuff he was doing in Paris. 
and I was just blown away. I was like, holy shit, you know? Yeah. Um, so what, I, what, what about them in particular? Well, he had a, uh, Cartier Bresson is credited with this saying, this sort of philosophy called the decisive moment, right? Which is a picture. When you take a picture, if you're out looking, if you're going out and doing photography, you're waiting for the decisive moment, particularly in regards to like human interaction, you know, with things. He was uh, one of the founders of Magnum Photos, of course, the collective, uh, along with Robert Capa, who was famous, famous fucking war photographer. But he, he's waiting for the perfect moment to take a picture when everything lines up, you know? Hmm. Um, as far as like light exposure, people moving or whatever, he would sit at a spot forever and wait, you know? Um, and for me, that sort of guided the way I try to view photography. I find myself shooting less and less photos when I go out to shoot and waiting for that yeah. moment. And when I shoot with the Leicas, the M's, everything is manual. There's no autofocus. There's no rapid fire. There's none of that shit. Hmm. It's like point, focus, compose, shoot. Hmm. You know? So there's, it's, it's a much slower process, but I'm getting much better pictures yeah. than I did when I first started with like, uh, you know, a Canon DSLR that could shoot a million frames a minute and a big zoom lens. I use prime lenses too, which forces you to engage with your subject. Hmm. There's no telephoto. Yeah. You have to move into almost the picture. So when you say better pictures, define that how do you mean how do i mean better because they're visually more striking the okay. subject matter is better yeah. um you know they're composed better exposed better hmm. everything is is on point <laughs> yeah you know um i but, saw that i saw that you'd been away on a couple of those um like Leica events yeah yeah i just had a, a well it's still up but I don't know when this is going to air, but it's up until like November 7th. The Leica Gallery in Boston hmm. had an opening, uh, which two days ago, Tom Hanks stopped by and saw my show, I was told. <laughs> nice. I wish I'd been there. Yeah. You know? Um, but then, and then I spoke at Photoville, which is a, a big photo sort of exhibition conference in Brooklyn mm -hmm. um, for them. I do. Uh, I have a really good relationship with them. They sent me a, a loaner over here to Europe to shoot with their their new model. How does that come about? Uh, the guy who walked in here earlier. Um, I, he when I when I started researching these cameras like Leicas, they're expensive by yeah. the way, very expensive. Yeah. Uh, I started researching these cameras because I was looking at Henri Cartier Bresson, hmm. and. I was like, oh, who do I know who has one of these things? And I started asking through the sort of music network of photographers yeah. I know, music, music uh, photographers. They were like, oh, Andrew Stewart shoots Leica, who's here tonight. He'll be shooting Slayer. He's been doing stuff with them. And I happen to know him loosely. So I was shooting in Hollywood. I was shooting Duff and Slash from mm -hmm. Guns N' Roses just when my buddy Scott Uchida and Andrew showed up and brought his Leica and he's like, do you want to play with this? I was like, yes. <laughs> and so uh, he let me shoot that day with it and I was just hooked. Mm. It's, it, it requires some work. You know, it's yeah. not like a, you can put it on dummy mode or whatever. It requires some work to, and uh, it's just totally changed the way I view everything. So, and then, of course, Nikki when Six. You, when you say, yes, we'll Nikki get to Six that in a shoots. second, but when you say it's changed how you view everything, do you actually mean, like, you look at things differently Absolutely. now, even when you're not carrying a camera? Oh, always. Yeah, constantly. Yeah. I am constantly, photography has done that even before I shot like her, though. I'm constantly framing everything. Yeah. Looking at light, looking at the leading lines. Like, I'm looking at you right now and thinking of your position with that line, that line, that line. Yeah. And you're right there. And if I were to shoot, you would be over to this side of the photo. Hmm. You know? Um, I, I'm driving. I'm walking. Everywhere I look, I'm noticing light. Yeah. First and foremost. Do you know William Mortensen? 
Do you mm. know that guy? Mm -mm. He was a, a, an American photographer who, um, who, he wrote a book called The Command to Look. Right. And uh, he, but he also is, is quite famed, again, like I said about photographers that make pieces that look like, almost like paintings, that his work is very much like that. And you know that, that uh, publishing house, Feral House? Of course. So, yeah. They put out, there's a couple of books. There's one called American Grotesque, which mm -hmm. is like a, uh, almost like a monograph of his work. Right. But they republished The Command to Look as well. Right. And that's really interesting from an artistic perspective. You'd get a lot from it, I think. Because it's prose? Y yeah, it's, it's uh, he, he talks about the line of things and how it's almost in, in an archetypal manner. Like if we have this curve here, <coughs> this will create this sense of feeling within things and it represents all these archetypes. Right. If we have very sharp monochromatic diagonals that are almost like teeth or right. like daggers, then that creates things within that way. You well, know? that's you know, the way the human eye yeah. is. That's why you don't, if, for the most part, if I'm gonna take a picture, the subject, generally you don't put it directly in the middle. Yeah because it's boring, you know? You're, you want to lead into it, yeah. Yeah, there's no leading or whatever. But yeah, so, yeah, and then of course Nikki Six shoots like a, yeah. and then they flew me and him over to Wetzlar, Germany last year. Was it last year? Earlier, well, either last year or earlier this year to, for the release of their new model. So we hung out and got to play with these new cameras. That's pretty wild. Yeah, it's, we're just like little kids. Hmm. Like, holy shit. <laughs> you know what are we doing here with all these like magnum photographers other photographers i like um have you heard of fan ho no ah, he's a chinese photographer who shot a lot in hong kong in the 40s and 50s and okay a lot of high contrast black and white stuff yeah. um and kind of ouija-esque uh, not as yeah but i would say more like the asian Cartier Bresson, like, okay. but some of his stuff looks like paintings. Um, and then Costa Manos, I got to hang out with him. Yeah, he's a Greek American photographer from South Carolina, um, who lives now up in Provincetown, Massachusetts. I went up to hang out with him, and he took me and another photographer around, showed us where to shoot. I love his work. Um, Ara Guller, who just passed away, he was known as the Eye of Istanbul. <laughs> He is, uh, he's, he's you know you're doing all right when you've got like something that's almost verging on like a wrestling name referred yeah. to you <laughs> within, your, no, within your field. He shot Istanbul um, a lot in the 50s and 60s before it became a lot more modernized. Yeah. And he just passed away, but he was, you know, a lot of, I don't think a lot of Americans know a lot about him. Yeah. You know, or maybe even in Europe that much, but over there, and his work is freaking fabulous i'll check it out all right yeah. we should we should wind it up because we've been 45 minutes right we didn't even get into half the stuff but we can do that for another time yeah is yeah. that okay with you that's fine with me yeah yeah you good yeah sure cool thank you cheers Thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you'd like to keep up to date with Randy and his photography, um, please check out his only social media page, which is on Instagram, which is at D Randall Bly, which is D-R-A-N-D-A-L-L-B-L-Y-T-H-E. I will um, put that in the notes anyway, but yeah, I just thought I'd spell that out as well. Because it's spelling, yay. So all the stuff to do with the band is, is online as well, which is at Lamb of God. Uh, I'd also state that I've been thinking about the podcast a fair amount recently. And I realize that it's nowhere near as regular as it should be, but I still feel like this is my opportunity to sit down and have conversations with people that are either my friends already or people that I want to be friends with. And I feel like... I. I see in them through their work um, that we have a lot of common interests and, and I, I kind of set these up so that I can discuss that with them and see if I'm 
if I'm right and think that the things that I see within their work is what they intend it to be. Um, and generally when that happens, we, we end up becoming good mates. So yeah, I could be banging these out a lot more and I probably should, I guess, if I was actually thinking properly that this should be um, a bit more of a thing, if you know what I mean. I should be doing them every week or every other week. And I've also thought about doing sort of solo episodes where I just sit and ramble much like I'm doing now, but that kind of defeats the object of it being someone who isn't me, I guess, if it was just me. Yeah, that probably wouldn't work. Um, but yeah, I've done a few other podcasts for other people as a guest. Um, recently, I did Off the Beaten Track and also Hardcore Listing. And um, I'm going to do, do an episode of The Downbeat with Craig as well soon, which will be which will be a laugh because I think his podcast is amazing. If you don't listen to it, you should check it out. You don't have to be a drummer to enjoy it because I am not a drummer, but I do enjoy their conversations that he has because they're always ace. Uh, and I think I'm going to end up being the first guest on it who has no clue about drums. Um, it's just I like doing them in person rather than via Skype. Um, it also takes ages to paint the covers. So, yeah, I should probably do something with those as well because I could, ha I could, they take so long. And I think that if I was to um, do something to sort of, help support the podcast i should probably make shirts or prints or something um i will also ask you that send any thoughts and suggestions to the socials which are at swim podcast if there's anyone that you want to hear on the podcast um reach out and also tag them as well because that would always make things a lot easier so as always thank you for listening spread the word Please recommend the podcast to people you think will be into it. Leave a nice review on iTunes. Stream it on Spotify on loop as well. You don't even need to have the sound up. Just turn it down because then I can see some of that mythically elusive Spotify dollar. 